Hello and welcome. If you are trying to make sense of all the stuff that's been happening in the world over the last 48 hours, maybe even over the last four years, you're in the right place. Uh, we've got the perfect set of conversationalists to help us sort through it all. Uh, the bios are in the program, but I'll do a little bit of introduction. So uh, to my immediate left, we have Elizabeth Rosenberg, who is one of the world's leading thinkers around national security, um, particularly as it relates to economic strategy. Um, we also have Monique Chu, who has spent, Dr. Monique Chu, sorry, who's spent a career looking at international relations and specifically uh, China-US relations as well. And then on the end, we have another doctor who's a foremost economic strategist uh, who's now at Net Wealth. Uh, investments. Thank you all for, for being here and very much look forward to the conversation. So uh, I now work at Netflix and we have this show called End of the Effing World. Uh, and so I start there. Actually, that's not a question, just a plug for Netflix. So uh, let's, let's make some context out of everything that we see happening in the world. Are we in a whole new era experiencing things that we've never experienced before? repeating history or, or a bit of both. Elizabeth, do you want to kick us off? Are we in a new era of economic competition? Yeah. Yes, I'm going to go with yes on this. There are some things that make this era of competition unique, and I'll uh, start by talking about the US perspective. So you may have noticed that the United States is using its economic coercive tools, its aggressive economic policies. I'm talking about tariffs, sanctions, trade restrictions more commonly, they've become a tool of first resort. And the United States is looking at these, using them against um, major economies, bigger economies, and doing so more unilaterally. Also, many in the United States would define their greatest economic competitor, China, uh, as uh, a particular challenge and threat. It's the biggest economy that the United States has faced in competition since the United States became the biggest economy. And furthermore, it's not in the US security umbrella. There are many different values and different political and economic systems and practices, and that's seen by many in the United States as uh, fundamentally a threat. So that's different. But I will say some of the authorities that are used, the legal authorities, um, they're not new. That's right. not new. And uh, the use of economic shaping tools in great power competition, of course, that's not new either. Monique, your thought? Um, in many ways, I agree with what um, Elizabeth outlined earlier. And of course, one of the major features of the current geopolitical uh, climate at the global stage really pertains to the Sino-US uh, antagonism. Uh, with the Trump administration viewing China as the major threat, not only to American interest, but also to the Western um, liberal order in general. And so in many ways, I think we're in a new um, age because China's perceived threats to the US lies not only in material terms, uh, which can be measured in economic and uh, military terms, uh, but also in normative and ideational terms. Um, so at the material terms front, um, China is projected to take over the U.S. to become the world's largest economy in a few years. But of course, economists will come up with a different forecast as to when that year will arrive if Chinese economy uh, continues to um, slow down. But at the normative level, I think China's threat, um, perceived threats to the U.S., derived from three major sources. The first is the fact that um, the Chinese regime is authoritarian, it's not a democracy. The second is China's vision of development model really focuses on state-centric approaches. And it really puts economic development in front of civil and political rights, um, and in its own definition of human rights. In addition, when China uh, gained accession to WTO a few years ago, it was really uh, pre um, predicated on the expectation in the West that the Chinese state would eventually give up interventionist approach directing economic activities, but the opposite has turned out to be true. The third major source of normative threats that China has exerted uh, not only to the US, but also to the Western 
liberal order really has to do with China's Sinocentric worldview of the past, in which China has constantly seen itself as the middle kingdom with its tributary states um, you know, in surrounding areas to really pay tributes to the Chinese emperors of the past. And this, I think, is a historical experience of China that really has an everlasting impact on the Chinese psyche um, pertaining to the Chinese leaders. Well, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. In answer to your question, I think there are many things that are the same, but naturally there are some things that are different, as my two colleagues have highlighted. Let me maybe stress three things. Um, one is the shift in the balance of economic power from the West to the East. And I think that's having the profound impact economically, financially, and geopolitically. It's very much leading to the rise of China, growing influence of China, but not just of China. If we look at global growth, more of global growth is coming from emerging economies. So that's empowering them, and at the same time putting pressure on Western economies to adapt and change to that. And in regional terms, it very much moves the focus I would say, as it has been geopolitically for the last half century from across the Atlantic between the US and the old Soviet regime to the Indo-Pacific region from India in the West to the states in the East. So I think that's the first profound change. The second is also driven by economics in some respects, and that's the aftermath of the global financial crisis, which has led to growth in the West being low by historical standards. Yeah. And that's leading to growing domestic issues at home, whether in the States, here in the UK, or indeed on the continent. And indeed, in a nutshell, the challenge for Britain and Western Europe is how we reposition ourselves in this changing and growing global economy. And the third area I would stress and highlight, and the one that often doesn't get as much of focus sometimes as it should, is the institutional change. There has been much talk for years about the need for, say, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to adapt and change, and indeed they have. But at the same time, particularly with the rise of China, we've now started to see more institutional relationships emerge. I think we'll probably talk about the Belt Road later on, but we've seen other groups such as the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, these regional organizations become more important. So in a nutshell, three things. The shift in the balance of power profoundly changes things. Second, Western economies with slower growth need to continue to adapt and change and address new challenges. And third, the institutional setup, I think, is changing. The, the second that you raised, do you see that shift happening in the West quickly enough? to deal with the overall economic shift that's happening to the East? Um, well, in terms of the West, I think we need to differentiate maybe t between the States and here in Western Europe. I I'm very positive about the UK outlook, for instance, despite the political crisis we are currently in. What we've seen in recent years is a very flexible, adaptive UK economy. So I'm quite upbeat about the ability for the UK economy itself to come through and adapt and change. But I think in answer to your question, I think there's greater awareness about how we need to change in Western economies. It's executing that. And there are different issues in different economies at the same time. If we look on the continent, the euro area has a mix of different economies facing challenges. So I think in answer to your question, certainly there is more awareness of the need to change. Um, there's different views as to whether that's been done effectively enough. Elizabeth? On the North American or U.S. side, do you see the same or have the same optimism that Gerard had about Europe and the U.K.? Oh, my. Um, well, I think I might defer to Gerard to speak about that. But, uh, yeah, I think that there's plenty of positive indication that the EU region, the Euro and the U.K., uh, can be a strong, uh, strong economies that will indeed continue to have uh, powerful um, reserve currency, hard currency that is significant for the global financial system. I, that's, uh, there are challengers out there, but there are many attributes, even institutional, as much as these institutions are challenged, that yeah. uh, still have associated with them credibility, trust, experience, careful stewardship. That's not to be brushed aside lightly. Yeah. Monique, you, you talked about the three things that are leading to some of the concerns um, with China's growth 
Um, what's your sense of some of the motivation behind uh, China's, China's growth, economic growth over the... Um, and certainly since uh, President Xi Jinping came to power um, several years ago, um, he has totally shifted the nature of the Chinese foreign policy towards a more aggressive um, nature. And one of that package is the Build and Roll Initiative. I'm sure many of you here are probably uh, involved insiders uh, taking part in some of these uh, BI initiatives. Um, what I can see is the two primary motivations uh, uh, behind this uh, project. Uh, one is economic and second is in general strategic. Um, I think she um, initiated this project in order to deal with the stagnating exports and overcapacity issue in manufacturing at home. Uh, but in terms of uh, strategic calculations, I think there are three uh, related uh, motivations. The first is to actually try to maximize China's energy security considerations. Um, this involves diversifying sources of energy supplies, but also to ensure the transportation routes uh, will be, um, you know, safeguarded. And the second is actually to deal with the perceived security threat from Xinjiang by actually linking Xinjiang region with the Central Asian uh, region together. And the third one is actually um, to really, uh, going back to Elizabeth's earlier point about this idea of economic statecraft, using China's economic power in order to increase its political and uh, strategic influences in countries around the BI routes. So in a nutshell, it is certainly not purely economic motivations that are at stake according to the Chinese mm -hmm. official discourse. Yeah. Go, go ahead, jump in. Yeah, um, I think the, the story in China is tremendously uh, positive when one looks at it from an economic and financial perspective. The previous leadership Hu Jintao, uh, et cetera, they used to talk about the five imbalances, urban, rural, coastal, inland, environmental, social, and international. I think uh, what one often underappreciates in the West is the success that's been achieved yeah. in addressing many of these. And at Davos at the beginning of last year, the um, main spokesperson for China, Liu He, he gave a very good speech, and the way I characterized it was a focus was on the three Ps. Uh, poverty reduction, taking people out of extreme poverty in China, pollution control, and often I don't think it's appreciated the extent to which China is making headway in a very proactive way in terms of addressing environmental issues. There's a tendency often to think of China uh, being in the camp that's adding to global pollution. But when you look at the success of the industrial sector in China, it's, and also the way in which the West has exported uh, much of its manufacturing to the Indo-Pacific. What should not be a surprise is the fact that this is a big issue in China. And again, they actually, like in terms of poverty reduction, make it a very central feature of their policy focus. But the third P is the one that very much concerns people in the financial markets, and that's the prevention of risks. In recent years, there has been a concern from a financial market perspective that there has been a build-up of debt and leverage in China. Yeah. I think some of these fears are exaggerated, but nonetheless, the Chinese, from the domestic policy perspective, made clear last year they wanted to address them. The challenge from a global economic perspective is that last year we saw monetary policy tightening globally led by America, China tightening policy, and then we were hit by the trade dispute, and the combination of all those factors slowed the global economy. But the Chinese, as well as the Americans, have started to ease policy since. But in China, I think they've really have made headway in addressing those underlying issues. The challenge, I think, in the future is that from an economic perspective, while the trend for the economy will be up, one should not be surprised if there's greater volatility around the upward trend. Speaking of volatility, th these transitions are often, from one world power to the next, are often, at least historically, accompanied not by smooth economic transition, but by wars. Um, there is a, a fair amount of anxiety in the United States around China's growth. Is that anxiety, particularly on the national security side, one that you think is reasonable, Elizabeth, or 
yes. exaggerated. By the way, I just want to point out how interesting it is that you're talking, you premise this by saying a transition from one power to another, which is something we might pause and just discuss. Go but, ahead. But, but I'll answer your question. Um, Yes, it's not just the growth of China and what it may mean for the United States that, as you point out, an authoritarian power with very different approaches to uh, prioritization of economic growth uh, versus other, um, uh, other values or uh, social policies, what it means that such a powerful, formidable economic actor could be so prominent in the world stage, have such a significant role in attempting to, and succeeding in some cases, reset rules and norms, judicial review processes, I mean, all the way. But the anxiety in the United States is not just about um, a, a pure uh, China growth play and what that may mean, but also the way in which China will use and leverage that growth. And there are anxieties in the United States about uh, more specific uh, harms, IP theft, um, uh, forced tech transfer, uh, the kind of commercial arrangements that many uh, U.S. but other global firms uh, find objectionable that force them into essentially ceding certain comparative advantages and, uh, and high technologies, uh, and a desire to correct that to restore some of those dislocations or cheating, as they're sometimes called, uh, to uh, rules of the road that have been uh, more established rules by uh, major industrial economies over more years. So there's really a broad coalition. Is, is that feasible, though? I mean, I, I no longer live in the United States, but when I did, I, I heard lots of conversation around structural change and driving structural change in China, but to the point that Monique made earlier, that may have been Western expectation, but it may not align with reality. Uh, um, Go ahead. So I teach Chinese politics um, here in the UK for over 10 years. Um, if you abide by this idea of modernization theory, um, the assumption would be when one day China's economy grows, over time you will see the rise of substantial power of the middle class, and this group in the population will in turn ask for political reforms. Uh, because without political reforms, uh, economic reforms uh, would, would, would be met with a lot of obstacles. So this, uh, however, has been challenged in recent years, especially since Xi Jinping came to power. Uh, in 2017, he ended the two-term um, 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 limitation to the Chinese presidencies. And so this has been perceived as a major challenge to the, the, the rules of the game that post Mao era has actually been established. Of course, from Xi's perspective, or I'm just imagining that I understand what he thinks. I always joke with my students by saying, if we want to understand what the Chinese leaders are really thinking, we should insert a semiconductor chip into their brains. So I'm just guessing. Um, of course, one can argue that um, China is faced with insurmountable amount of challenges. Therefore, the country needs a strong leader like him to continue to rule beyond the 10-year limit. Um, but, but maximum power may lead to uh, corruption. So this is a big, uh, I think, uh, uncertainty that we have to watch because so far we have touched upon many of the economic uh, risk factors. But I think this is some of the, one of the major internal ones that we have to look at. So uh, Elizabeth, you noted that I used the term transition. So say more about that presumption. And the conversation started as a transition to the East from the West. And I've, I think, have focused us on China, but there's also India and many of the other nations uh, in Asia. And so it would be good to, to talk a little bit, not only about my presumption of transition, but some of the other major economies that, that deserve attention and investment yeah. uh, in the East as well. So first presumption about transition and then maybe draw it around the other economies. I will say, I think, Often when people come to this question, they're thinking about um, economic size, and we know many metrics to judge one economy versus another, and uh, that can be a very helpful way to try and get a hold on the uh, perspective and uh, figure out who's up, who's down, and what does that mean. But 
one thing that doesn't necessarily help us get at is what does it mean when there's a clear undermining of the supremacy of one major financial center, one leading currency for payments for a store of value, and the rise of certain other alternatives, even if they are marginal, that cause us to challenge certain assumptions about uh, technology superiority or um, debt sustainability, um, and perhaps moving away from a concept of uh, one, a transition to, from one major economy to another, but thinking about um, other significant nodes in the system, and this might have been what you were getting at, talking about other significant economies that have contributions to make, or for that matter, there's lots of interesting conversation at this conference about how um, uh, other forms of value, uh, digital tokens, tokenized assets, may also challenge our thinking about who's up and who's down. So just a point to say, let's pause and think about that and uh, avoid thinking about the transition we saw from the uh, sterling to the dollar being the particular future that we see at some point in the, you know, in the coming uh, years and decades. You were nodding when I alluded yeah. or mentioned India. Your thoughts on India? Well, the previous and, comments, there are so many different angles one can take it on. In terms of the a previous question, there was an interesting book, the Thucydides trap about the rise of new powers and how existing powers contend with them. But um, when one looks at it from a global perspective, one could, it can be very complex, but if we try and simplify it into terms of perspiration and inspiration, perspiration reflecting demographic change, some of the movers there are quite significant. Um, if one takes India, uh, roughly one in six people in the world is Indian, Average age of India is, what, 27? So one in 12 people in the world is an Indian under 27. That's a pretty powerful dynamic. But when one looks at Africa, um, and when I used to be head of research at Standard Chartered, I traveled to Africa quite extensively. When one looks at the demographics there, Africa's working age population is set to rise by twice that of India and China combined in the next 15 years. So those demographic changes can be dividends if you plan for them, and it will increase the importance of those economies. Obviously, there are challenges. The inspiration side is very much linked into the fourth industrial revolution. Um, there's different ways of measuring this, but innovation and investment in new technology is very key. And America and Britain really dominate when it comes to universities. You, I think you mentioned, Dean, you're in Amsterdam, but when one looks at it, the top of the top 100 universities in the world, over 30 are from the States. Yeah. Next is Britain with about, I, I guess it's 14, 16. It depends whether you use the QS or the Times measure. Britain has more in the top 100 than the rest of Western Europe put together. Yeah. Then you've got Australia and Hong Kong, but China is now investing very heavily, but it's about keeping at the forefront of that innovation. But the last point you touched on about financial sectors, last November, I was asked to speak at the inaugural Shanghai Import Expo. And the reason for mentioning it, it, it was Xi Jinping spoke, and I was speaking in one of the smaller rooms, <laughs> and the session was on the rise of the RMB, and there were people from the PPOC, SAFE, and I'm on the board of Bank of China in the UK here, and that's why I was invited out, I guess. But there were 650 people in the room, leading lights from the financial sector, and the, the depth of the discussion over three and a half hours was quite impressive. And it was not about displacing the dollar, but it was about the rise. Basically, as China grows as an economy, it has to deepen and broaden its capital markets. Its bond market is becoming more important. So it's alongside the dollar. The great thing for America is America rises to the challenge. And hopefully for the UK, given London, we try and be a good place to do business in, but also a good place to do business from. So the financial centers that exist at the moment do need to rise to the challenge. And hopefully, we'll, it's a win-win situation. We, we talk about it as a challenge, but hopefully, if it turns out right in economic, financial, and geopolitical terms, there'll be net winners. Yeah, you, you alluded to it before with the importance of institutions in, in supporting and creating platform for growth yeah. uh, for new economies. I wonder your, your thinking on whether where those institutions are today relative to history and whether the geopolitical dynamic between the East and the West limits the ability for those institutions to play the role that they've traditionally played. Yeah, um, well, I think the challenge always is it's more difficult for institutions to change at the speed at which people want them to change. 
And also, there's always a danger that you don't get rid of things. Like in firms, business for businesses, you often say, stop doing things and start doing new things. Don't just add more and more. Right. Um, with, when it comes to institutions, it's very hard to find people saying, let's stop this institution. So you tend to add more and more institutions. Are there ones that you think? Yeah, like the G20 has become more important since the global financial crisis. At that time, some people suggested it could displace the G7 or G8, which was never going to be the case. Right. So we have the G7, G8, depending on which year you're talking about, <laughs> plus the G20 as well. But I, I think the institutions, if they don't change, the lesson from the last few years is new ones emerge. Uh, but things fall between the gaps. And I guess the big worry people have had in recent years has been the globalization and the ground rules that people took for granted. And I think you touched on this when you talked about IPR and those other issues. There are, there are enough ground rules that people buy into in terms of the global order. Yeah, yeah. my role is to make sure you're talking. So if you're talking, just ignore me. Yeah, no. Well, I want to make an amendment to this. And so you point out um, uh, an addition, if you will. So you point out the challenge for institutions adapting and, uh, of course, that it may be quite slow moving. Um, one way to leapfrog or fast track that can be a kind of informal alliance structure. So in addition to the, uh, the creation of new institutions, which may have a place and uh, allow for new formulations of leadership, that informal alliance structure may on economic issues like may... Yeah, the trilateral group, you know, the United States, uh, Europe, and Japan as major economies yeah. pulling together to think about certain economic priorities or national securities as relevant to their economic uh, activity and rules, for example. That may be a new, uh, it seems to me, a significant new trend uh, in the near future. It allows for faster adaptation and coordination, uh, faster than institutions, these formal institutions may grow. And I have watched with interest as the Trump administration has talked about, for example, uh, coalitions of the cautious, um, which is one way of discussing how you can bring together other major economies or security partners to talk about your economic interests as they relate to security matters. So this is just one example. But that could be a trend we wouldn't want to ignore as we nevertheless must watch and participate in uh, the reformulation and adaptation of institutions so fundamental to governance, economic governance uh, globally. Much of the conversation is focused on governments increasingly thinking is and expectations are that companies should be playing a prominent role in helping to navigate and build bridges. Uh, what do you see as the role of companies, corporations, in addition to alliances and institutions in navigating in this geopolitical environment? Shall I start? Yeah, or whomever. Or? Yeah. Okay. Well, they're, um, in a way, foot soldiers or first movers or the unwilling implementers of policies sometimes, and the uh, flip side of that is to say um, uh, opportunistic and innovators seeking advantage even as governments may uh, uh, struggle to get along or to find different uh, um, uh, structures to cooperate informally. So one thing I see from the United States is that there are a number of companies that seek not to raise their hand and not to get caught in the middle of the geopolit geopolitical no. competition that we are here to talk about in this panel. And one way to do that can be to uh, reshape supply chains, to move manufacturing, to avoid and in redirect investments, including avoiding the US market in certain instances. And it forces many companies to think about whether they're um, in China for China, or if not, and they were seeking a lower cost labor environment, for example, whether they want to shift to elsewhere in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, elsewhere, in order to continue with their growth strategy. So we're seeing some differentiation of R&D activities, manufacturing that may uh, represent a kind of um, clubs of trade or groupings of trade or of data um, that I expect will continue. And yeah. the companies are creating that. Yeah. Um, I have to say, when it comes to technological innovation, uh, the trend of spin on has been the mainstream development. In other words, nowadays, the most innovative technologies start from commercial firms. Uh, 
then in turn, these technologies can get transferred to the defense side to help with national uh, modernization of any single country's military. And so if you look at the recent emerging areas of technologies, including quantum computing and artificial intelligence, as well as semiconductors, it is always the commercial firms that are taking uh, the lead. And so this is a major development that all the countries in the world have been aware of. And as to how private firms should navigate uh, in the current geopolitical competition uh, evolving in the US and China, of course, as Elizabeth said, they need to consider perhaps diversifying their risks by not putting the whole um, um, axe in the same basket. Uh, but at the same time, I think we should also, by looking at Trump's uh, trade sanctions against certain Chinese firms, I think there are some limitations to these sanction measures. And ultimately, I think some of these measures can be counterproductive. Uh, for example, some of the American firms that have been forbidden to supply to Huawei have actually suffered in commercial terms. And at Apple, the same Apple time, is a clear Huawei, example of that. Huawei has been able to actually uh, find alternative uh, suppliers within the global electronic supply chain. And many of these companies are actually headquartered in Taiwan. Uh, so in a nutshell, I understand this is a very complex issue. And as private firms, your ultimate goal is actually to maximize your profits. Uh, but um, if you also consider your social responsibilities by taking into account your own values and norms, such as democracy and freedom, then at the board member meetings at each of your headquarters, um, you need to really prioritize your material interest calculations as, some, uh, as well as some of the norms and values that you cherish. Do, do you, do, your comment leads me to think about the, the transition that I saw in, in I, I used to run a technology trade association that had um, 70 of the world's leading tech companies. And one of the things that I observed as a result of the trade war between China and the US is many companies rethinking their approach to China, and which led me to wonder who will actually benefit as a result of the current geopolitical dynamic given considerations and decisions that companies are making as a result, both on the ground in China as well as, as in the United States. And how and what we identify as the signal in the noise, if you will, for evaluating where things are going, for, going on a go forward basis. Um, any thoughts on, I know we over index on who's up and who's down, but the net impact thus far of the, the current competitive environment? There, it depends on how you come at this and what your criteria is. And there's certainly uh, an array of economic costs that have been well documented. Um, what costs China is, uh, uh, bears from the trade war in particular, uh, while it nevertheless has managed to, um, while responding to US tariffs with tariffs of its own, uh, reduce tariffs towards other companies, expand and diversify their trade to other companies, so moving up the value chain, seeking the opportunity to uh, an, sort of an exterior political um, uh, motivation or uh, reasoning to double down on made in China, 20, you know, technologies. Um, so there's an advantage there. There are other companies that have sought to reposition themselves, as you were saying, you know, in response to this and have figured out um, they've gotten a lot savvier on how to deal with U.S. Um, commerce laws and banking laws. So when we're talking about putting Huawei on the U.S. entity list, it's not illegal for these same U.S., ostensibly U.S. tech companies to source from for their foreign manufacturing or foreign operations the same components to Huawei. So there, there's a, an advantage that uh, certain companies are and their financial institutions are are taking from the situation, having learned how to move more nimbly in this system. Uh, I, I would just say, though, that you know I, I do think we're at the beginning of a long road. It's going to outlast Trump. It's going to get worse before the U.S. general election, and it will be durable by you know and promulgated in the United States by public policymakers in both parties. Um, 
and who will be creative in how to adapt these tools, uh, restricting trade and barring banking relationships in the future. So we should think about costs, but I think we're probably at the beginning of the curve here. Are there, are there principles that, that companies should be looking at as a way of figuring out how to navigate in this, in this environment? Uh, the point I was made, or a question I was asking earlier about signal in the noise, what are the things yeah, that maybe are I baseline? Answer, answer that not explicitly, but bring it to get, just come in on the back of the other points. But obviously there's lots of focus here on the bilateral relationship between China and the US, but I think we need to look at yeah. the global issues. And it, there are many different drivers. There's hard power, that as has been touched on. There's also soft power we haven't touched on. That's a very important factor. Institutional relationship. and. Then there's the economic financial aspect, which I think is key for how I would look at it. We are not only having the fourth industrial revolution as such, we're having a data revolution, we're having a digital revolution. So when one looks at the private sector, it's not just companies, it's people themselves. And governments have to enable uh, small firms to grow. Uh, the financial sector plays a, uh, a fantastic role within directing finance, not just to the growing economies in China, but elsewhere. So I would be quite excited because when one looks at some of the big global issues, people are actually having more influence in terms of the environmental agenda, driving things forward. We're and it, go ahead, and I was going to say, the challenge with the trade war is that, in economic terms, it's clearly undesirable. But in many respects, um, it's difficult to see how you stop that data revolution continuing, that digital revolution continuing. Uh, the challenge, of course, with change is that there are always losers as well as winners, and you need to help those in the near term who are impacted by the transition. But I think there are lots of reasons to be positive. Now, of course, if you feel challenged as a country, that might make you more defensive, um, and therefore you do need leadership to help bring people through outline the challenges and the vision that lies ahead. S say more about where you see opportunities. Because um, in, well, in a moment, moment like this well, of change, people, yeah. there's always <coughs> opportunities that we often don't pay enough attention to. OK. Um, well, if you have this audience here, they, they've had 10 years since the global financial crisis. There is a tendency, if you're sitting here in London or maybe in Boston next year, where Cybos is, to think, the world economy has had a really difficult time, and Western economies have had low growth rates. But when you look at the size of the world economy, it's interesting. The IMF measure shows it, beginning of the century 2000, the world economy was about $32 trillion in size. When the financial crisis started, it was about $62 trillion in size. The end of last year, it was $86 trillion right. in size. Now, these are nominal figures, right. but only a small amount of that is inflation. A big chunk of it is real economic growth. Much of it may be seen in China, some of it seen in India, other countries. So the global economy is growing. It's all, the opportunity is to actually think about the global opportunities, the emergence of the middle class outside of Western economies. The challenge in the Western economies is that as we get older, we need to make sure artificial intelligence is used as a force for good. We're creating jobs for younger people. We're starting to see people in more productive jobs. It, the low productivity issue has been the challenge in the West. So the opportunity is to recognize the need to almost enable your economies to have high productivity, so to encourage more innovation, more investment, but to recognize the global dynamic is changing. I hope you see that as an opportunity. I do, certainly do. I, I think opportunities um, can potentially start with this idea of uh, know others and know thyself. Um, so at the University South Center, my colleagues and I are now competing a, a report uh, comparing different uh, regimes uh, in the European Union, the US, and, and China primarily in different uh, areas, such as internet governance, personal data, yeah. AI. And so we have uh, compare and contrast how different they are in order to identify potential business opportunities. And I think that's a kind of starting point uh, for us to look for opportunities in this seemingly really chaotic uh, condition. But in my capacity as an international relations scholar, I find it fascinating to study all the subjects we have covered so far. Elizabeth, thanks. 
Uh, well, maybe I'll take it in a different direction. Yeah. So let's okay. talk about opportunities missed. And um, uh, so I come to you, visit you all from Washington, where I sit and live. And it seems to me there's an opportunity to talk about opportunities missed every day. And uh, watching the economic governance, if you will, the conduct of international economic policy by the Trump administration, it does seem to me that there's a lack of appreciation about the near and long-term damage that is being wrought by breaking down um, multilateral institutions, the trust and credibility with partners, trading partners, with security partners, and what that may then mean for the execution of future foreign policy and economic policy. So it's a little difficult, uh, maybe intangible, to get at um, what does that, um, that rupture in trust mean? What will that mean? How do you translate that into a calculation about risk or the volatility we're talking about, even if in a continued yeah. growth scenario? But uh, the appreciation of that is um, uh, inadequate, I would say, in Washington right now. And what that does lead to is missed opportunities to do things like shore up um, vulnerabilities in a potential future downturn scenario and uh, shoring up relationships with uh, other economies or security partners that could be necessary in a time of an escalating, escalating crisis, whether a hot conflict or an economic crisis. Interesting. So we're at Cybos. Um, advice, thoughts for the folks in the room in navigating in this political environment? Yeah, well, in terms of the financial and banking sector, we've touched on some of the issues before. Um, but in the aftermath of the financial crisis, um, it's very much about making sure that the financial sector is seen as relevant in terms of driving domestic economic growth and ensuring more people share in economic success. And, and how do they do that? Well, um, in terms of... One of the challenges, and we, I've used the word many times, but um, it's about ensuring there's enough finance available to, for instance, SMEs, there's more lending to the future growth sectors. Um, when one looks at the... Well, if we take, say, the Bank for International Settlements, they do um, interesting analysis of build-up of risks. And for the banking sector, they show how the banking sector has taken on increased risk ahead of the global financial crisis. Central banks globally under the Financial Stability Board and national governments have coordinated to make the banking sector safer. What we need to make sure is that we're not seeing a build-up of risks elsewhere within the financial yeah. sector. And the Bank for International Settlements in their recent quarterly report talked about in a low rate environment, there's an increased search for yield. So there's always these challenges, but it's about making sure that we avoid, if possible, another global financial crisis. Naturally, there will be more stress at times. That's always the case. But the financial sector seems a lot more resilient, or the core of it. But it's about making sure the finance is available to younger people if they need to access finance to buy property, in obviously, people need to have deposits and stuff like that. It's about making sure the finance is available to small, medium-sized firms to grow. And we build up some of the... We don't see a build-up of the excesses that we saw preceding previous crises. Yeah. And it's more responsible behavior by the financial sector. And I would say that if one looks over the last decade, um, I think people in the room would probably be encouraged and positive. But at the same time, naturally, people are cognizant of what happened before and making sure we avoid it reoccurring. Yeah, fighting the last battle, right? You, you made the point earlier about the importance of driving productivity and economic productivity. Is the process and approach to doing so different in today's geopolitical environment than before? Well, I, I think it comes back to a core issue. We haven't explicitly mentioned it, but it's been underneath much of what we're saying. Is globalization continuing or is globalization going to go into reverse? If you look at uh, global exports relative to GDP, that's lower than it was a decade ago, I think. So um, some people look at these measures and the res reshoring of manufacturing to some Western economies. But um, innovation is key. And as long as we see continued innovation growth and we see a sort of 
sharing of that knowledge base, protecting, as you touched on earlier, intellectual property rights and those key core values, then it should be positive. If geopolitics starts to put barriers in place, trade barriers are naturally not good for economies, but if you start to see those barriers stopping the flow of information sharing and intelligence sharing, then I think that's a cause for concern. And I think you touched on that implicitly. Yeah, and so just to follow up on the final point Jira has mentioned, um, I think it's important to pay attention to the evolving evolution of China's cyber security related rules and regulations. Uh, because I think these rules and regulations can have potential repercussions for any foreign high-tech firms that want to operate uh, in China. And so, uh, on paper, China has toughened up uh, not only internet censorship, but also introduced new cyber rules and regulations. So, they can really raise the cost and complexity of doing business in China. Uh, for example, um, if the Chinese government decides to offer a very expensive interpretation of so, some of the really wishy-washy, unclear regulations um, pertaining to inspection of the equipment and storing data uh, in China, uh, then high-tech firms, before going to operate in China, really have to carefully study the potential costs uh, because that can actually, if these kind of uh, rules are put in place, um, then China will be permitted to really steal related intellectual property. So this is an area to watch, yeah. Advice, and then I want to come back to the question on whether globalization is dead. Oh good, all right, well <laughs> let me get in here before we do that. So um, <laughs> advice, it depends on who you are, which your, what your industry is, your risk tolerance. So I started my career doing energy co in the energy commodity trading world, and if I were that kind of cowboy trader that I uh, was trained by and grew up with, I would look at the current environment and think, this is terrific. There's lots of opportunity to try and seek an advantage and uh, place the right bet, the right hedging strategy, and do just fine. And in volatility, there are some people who will make out great. They seek the opportunity to play in that environment. If you are a more cautious market participant at a bank, uh, you're engaged in manufacturing opportunity, uh, activities, particularly in high tech, you might want to be extra careful and to uh, approach this volatility with um, a mind towards insurance policies derived from locating in jurisdictions that look to not get cross caught in the crosshairs or to diversify in several different jurisdictions. Uh, so I, I think it depends on where you sit, uh, and, uh, but in general in this, well, in this audience, maybe more of the latter. Um, yeah. let's, let's play things forward. We've got a few more minutes, but five years out, what's your expectation about the geopolitical environment, the competitive, uh, more isolationist environment that, that we see today? Do you see it continuing forward, uh, splintering off in different ways? What, what would be your prediction? And how do, what advice would you, what would you suggest to the people in the room to be able to navigate in the world that you're predicting five years from now? It's a really good question, and I hope we keep asking and answering that often over the next five years. And um, my first piece of advice would be to watch the ideology and the rhetoric coming out of the rule setters, so the uh, bank supervisors and policy makers, um, the uh, financial planners, people invested in the um, uh, thinking about regulations to spur uh, innovation or uh, those who might take a more um, cautious mindset and basically for sort of regulatory arbitrage, forcing um, uh, financial technology developers or in those AI, supercomputing, biotech industries to move uh, to a different jurisdiction. So I do think that there are good, solid, enduring arguments for uh, maintaining global flows in a variety of um, consumer goods, industrial goods, where there's um, uh, a lot of flexibility and um, uh, a substitutability in the market. The United States will continue to need Chinese money in its capital markets, um, regardless of the uh, ideological, uh, political debates that uh, exist and that may create intensive barriers 
in certain areas of uh, economic, uh, certain technology areas or certain economic areas. So I do think we will see more uh, disaggregation and segmentation in certain sectors, but the notion that we might have a whole scale decoupling, forcing the rest of the world to choose, let's set that aside as too blunt and unrealistic. Um, my final piece of advice is for uh, those of you here um, who are interested still in China's future um, to carefully observe and watch the domestic development of this country. Not only about economic development, but also the political dimension that I have earlier uh, alluded to. Um, David Shemble published a book about China's future, and when it comes to China's pol uh, economic, uh, political future, he has outlined four scenarios. Um, because so little is coming out of Beijing about the decision-making process involving the, 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 the highly powerful figures in, in China. Uh, it is this very area that we have to keep watching. Uh, for example, what has been happening in Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xinjiang can be extremely relevant. Uh, will Xi Jinping continue his endeavors to suppress internal dissents? Uh, if that's the case, does that reflect upon a deep sense of insecurity on the part of Chinese leadership? Uh, if so, uh, how can we actually operate in such kind of uh, environment uh, when you decide to invest in this country? Based on everything you know, is that where you see things going? Um, yes. Um, I think the current uh, CCP regime, who is going to celebrate its 70th uh, anniversary of PRC on the 1st of October, has, of course, uh, had a brilliant record in terms of poverty alleviation, uh, economic development, and the economic growth has been the main pillar sustaining the CCP's legitimacy. Uh, but if the Chinese economic growth uh, are, is likely to slow down, uh, then the question will be what should be the, the, the right pillar to support the CCP legitimacy. And so my observation is what we have seen so far from Xi, uh, Xi Jinping in terms of suppressing internal dissents, dealing with the peripheral regions, the minorities, uh, really reflect a deep sense of insecurity on the part of the leadership. Um, as I said earlier, I don't have a microchip, um, you know, inserted in his brain, so I can't really know what he really thinks. Uh, but this is really an area that um, um, you as private sector actors have to watch. So aside from economic and financial developments uh, in China, I think it's crucially important to look at the, the political developments, even though sometimes it's really difficult to get the information that we want to get because of control over information flow. Yeah. yeah. Gerard, yeah, you get the last there word. Is, there are so many different areas again. Naturally, I think just following on, the um, bilateral relationship between China and the US will be center stage. And everything associated with that will come to the fore. Um, not just the trade war now, but the South and East China Seas. Um, but I don't think countries will be expected to choose between one or the other, as has been touched on. But beyond that, the, the good economics, I often think, is good politics. And the question then is how the world economy will perform. There's considerable near-term uncertainty. But if one looks at the financial sector and the banking sector and the people in the room, what one sees is the role finance can play, should play, and needs to play in fostering economic growth and ensuring more growth is seen in the developing, emerging regions of the world, as well as the major financial centers continuing to develop. And sort of, if one looks at London, for instance, it's positioned itself well in recent years in terms of Islamic finance, green bonds, offshore Chinese currency. So there's lots that's happening in the financial sector, I think plays a very important role. And maybe I should mention the UK. I think Brexit is a phenomenal opportunity for the UK to reposition itself. Despite the politics at the moment, the UK economy in the last three years has demonstrated what all economists agreed upon before the referendum three years ago, that the UK is one of the most dynamic open economies. And we've created over one million new jobs in the last three years. Not all of them may be as high paid as we would like, so I, su I suspect then that you would say in five years, 
Brexit will have truly exited? Um, I would like to think that we would have had Brexit in five years. Um, the go government um, plans to leave the EU with a deal by the end of October. Um, that is still possible, and it requires both the UK and the EU to agree together on that. So I think, yes, the UK will have left the EU and will be positioning itself well. If one looks at globalization, we are currently in the world's global city. Deloitte, one of the consultancies in London, a few years ago did analysis of cities with skilled workers. And the number one city with most skilled workers was London by a considerable distance. L New York was second. But in the top five, it also included Boston, where Cybos is going to next year. But London is a real global city. Um, the challenge in the UK is to see more of that success shared across the whole of the country. But and yes, it will are, are there, since you were listing places that that Cybos has been, and it's an amazing list of cities, are there, truly the last question, are there cities, places that Cybos has not been that we, the folks in this room, should be thinking about given the current political environment as true opportunities? Well, maybe, could I follow up on that in a sense? Yeah. Um, a few years ago, McKinsey did a very interesting analysis of global cities. And then, so it's probably five years ago, but I doubt if it's changed too much. And then it showed that the top 600 cities in the world accounted for half of global growth. Yeah. In 25 years' time, the expectation was the top 600 cities in the world would account for, I think it was about two-thirds of global growth. But the big issue was that currently of that top 600, 157, if I'm correct, are in the West. Wow. In a quarter of a century, only 20 are expected to be in the West. So Dar es Salaam, Dhaka are expected to see big emerging middle classes grow. So it's keeping the breast of the fact that the current global financial centers like London, New York, need to continue to adapt and change, play to their strengths, and they will. But at the same time, we're likely to see new emerging centers, and you're seeing some already, obviously Shanghai, but there's one or two others. Any others that you would add? Emerging centers of excellence, rays of hope in the current geopolitical environment forecasting five years out? I was going to go a different way and say, what about a uh, significant uh, virtual participation from uh, cities around the world, recognizing the fact that um, you've talked about demographics here and uh, the rise of certain cities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the people who are innovating the uh, banking, payments, lending, tech for them will be in those right. uh, demographic centers. And so what we want to be, what we could be looking at then is which are the jurisdictions that are going to have the uh, regulatory framework uh, and mm. the ease of capital flow in order to facilitate the development of this tech. So that might point us to a really different jurisdiction. You know, yeah. how's, how's uh, well, let me not pick on anyone here, but <laughs> uh, how about looking by those criteria and then thinking about uh, a virtual participation? I think this community is going in that way anyway. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to the audience for being here and thank you for your thoughtful conversation.